Well, I'm in a series called, Can You Relate? Everybody say that. Can you relate? Can you relate? Today, I'm going to talk about something the great hymn writer James Taylor composed. Ain't it good to know you've got a friend? Everybody said that. Ain't it good to know you've got a friend? Jesus loved everybody the same, but he didn't have the same intimacy with everyone. We're as close to God as we want to be, but also even within human relationships, God, just, God gives us levels. Now, Jesus had the one, he, if you ask John, then he had the three, then he had the 12, and then he had the 70, and then he had the multitude. So you can love everyone, but you're not as close to everyone the same way. Jeremiah 30 says this, verse 21, their leader will be one of their own. Their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me. Now listen to this. For who is he who will devote himself? <clears throat> this is not good. Who is he or her who will devote themselves to be close to me, declares the Lord. That sounds to me like it's a decision that you make. You can be as close to the Lord as you want to be. You got to learn to develop a relationship with God the same way you would any friend or spouse where you just talk to them. You know, get into the habit of driving along, talking to the Lord. You know, the Bible talks about walking with the Lord. The Bible says that God would come down and, and uh, talk to Adam in the cool of the evening in the garden. So don't just have this thing where you feel like you have to go somewhere and kneel or you have to raise your hands or whatever. Those things are great, but you know what? You can do this all the time. It's a continuous conversation. It can happen in your mind. It can happen, you know, for me, I need to speak it out. It's, it's, for some reason, I'm a little bit ADHD. One time I was preaching at a church and I said, I'm a little ACDC. <laughs> but I meant ADHD. And so for me, it helps to say it. I don't know what it looks like for you. Just say, God, what does it take for me and you to have a conversation, a continual conversation, so that I can walk with you, so that I'm tuning my ear to hear? You know, God will speak to you sometimes completely unrelated to anything you're thinking about. And he'll give you direction for something that you asked him yesterday about. It's just amazing to me. Uh, put this uh, picture up, Tony. You guys have seen this before. Uh, that's just a nice fountain. I, I use this as an example. I actually have this. I, I pray with this. You know, when I get to what I consider the, the holy of holies, where I'm interceding for other people, I actually use this as an example. And the whole idea is the water comes up in the middle. And then it spills over to the top bath. And then the overflow goes to the next bath. And the overflow goes to the next bath. And so the key is we love because he first loved us. If our relationship priorities are not right, we're trying to minister down here to the world. And we haven't filled up ourselves yet, our lives yet. And so I actually pray with that. I got a picture of it. And then it's, you know, Bill Alderman made me a great sample. It's God, your life, your spouse, your children, your spouse before your children. That didn't, I didn't get a single amen. Amen. Uh, local church, community, country, and world. The whole idea is we love because he first loved us. Until I receive it and until my life is filled up with the love of God, I really don't have anything to give anyone else. And then the priority of relationship is just that way. You know, your family and then your church family and then the world. We're going to finish next week talking about the world. But I love that. Jesus, your life, your family, your church. And uh, your, your life, we talked about last week, which is really a healthy soul. A lot of people neglect that. But the Bible says to love others as you love yourself. And so I would even say, accept yourself. Who has God made you to be? Are you free to be yourself? Now, how many of you know, there's an obnoxious side of all of our personalities. Everybody say amen. amen. We've all seen it. We've all participated in it sometimes. I'm not saying to release every crazy thing in you. I'm just saying the, the true you that God made you to be, are you comfortable with that? Are you self-aware? Are you okay in your skin? God wants you to be. And there's this whole thing in America, really around the world, of trying to compete and compare. And you, you judge yourself based on other people. You can't do that. You've got to say, God, who did you say I am? Amen. And then get comfortable with that. It's amazing how that will set you free. Um, John 15 says this, Jesus is talking. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I just think it's amazing that Jesus was saying, son of God, creator, I wanna be friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because the master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now, you are my friends. Since I've told you everything the Father 
has told me. Somebody said, the entire world, with the exception of one, is composed of others. Amen. I'm the exception. The entire world is composed of others. All of my problems, all my my problems that I face in life can be traced to humanity. Either my humanity or interacting with other people. You know, isn't that true? I love God. I read the Bible. Isn't it great? When I'm in my basement, I'm a spiritual giant. Everything is good. But then when I come out of the basement, I got to deal with real life and real people. Wow. Life takes a turn. Somebody flips you off in traffic, you know, who knows what it's just life. Amen. Or somebody's rude to you or whatever. Something goes amiss and it's so easy to get down and out and to start thinking of ways to get even so you can win in life. What if you don't need to win in life? What if you accept the fact that because of Jesus, you already won in life. Amen. Amen. I actually made this. This is a cross. Joe said I was carrying the cross. I put Velcro on it and I'm taking orders for thousand dollars a piece. So (laughs) the whole point though, I keep this back there because here's the deal. A lot of people think about their relationship with God. And it's, you know, some people say, I want to get born again. I'm gonna take my Bible. I'm going in the woods because all I need is Jesus. I don't need any people, but the Bible says, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And so not only is it vertical, with God, it's horizontal with people. Your relationship with God is incomplete without this. And a lot of people want to skip this because this is hard. Isn't it? I mean, wow, marriage. Marriage is great. Most of the time. (laughs) But you start getting an awareness of yourself. It's not just the other person, but the other person magnifies who you are. The other person shows you the truth about you. That's painful. It's like looking in the mirror. Your relationships are like looking in the mirror. An iron sharpens iron. So one man or a woman sharpens another. So the truth is, you need this in order to function properly in Christ. That's such a nice cross. We should just put it there all the time. Just kidding you. (laughs) So think about that. How do you choose a friend? How do you choose a friend? Here's some examples. Choose someone that is not envious, threatened, or intimidated by you. If they're just using you to figure out who they are, if they're just using you to find their identity, it's going to hurt you at some point. Nothing hurts like betrayal or a dagger in the back. Judas betrayed Jesus and even kissed him as he betrayed him. He had ulterior motives in following Jesus. God will show you this person doesn't have my best interest in heart. That doesn't mean you don't love them. That just means you don't get close to everybody. This is never that you turn off the spigot of love towards them. You love everyone. But there are some people that you have to back away from. You okay? There are some people that you just are not going to get close to. And that's okay. Um, If someone is threatened by your success, it's a problem waiting to happen. They're going to compete with you or they're going to rejoice with you. Which one are they? Are they always putting you in your place, which is just a little bit under them? Amen. You got to watch that. Everybody say, it's good. Next thing is, choose somebody who's committed to growth like you. Do they have the same destination in mind? Do they have the same place that they want to end up? Are they growing? Are they pushing? Are they pressing? Are they okay just chilling? Amen. Chilling is good to rest, but if that's all you do, you're not going to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in your life. My closest friends are constantly reading and feeding. They want to learn, grow, and develop. People who are not planning to grow are stuck where they are. And at some point, they might start taking you backwards with them or at least put you on pause. Next, choose somebody who shares your purpose and passions. You know, some people are just passionate about fishing and that's okay. Or hunting or whatever it is, motorcycles, whatever it is. All those things are wonderful. You're going to be the best friends with people who've got the same passion as you do. But some of it needs to be, what is your passion towards God? What is your passion towards seeing revival and awakening? Make sure that, that, that they're similar enough to you that you can connect. Community forms when someone loves what you love and when someone loves who you love. You know, if somebody remembers your kids' names, my kids are grown now, but I'm telling you, when they were growing up, if somebody remembered their name and reached out to them in a non-threatening, the whole world's watching you because you're the pastor's kid, but if they just relate to them as a human being, they went up 20 notches 
in my estimation of them. When people love who you love or when people love what you love, you get close to them. You need to find people who love what you love and who love who you love. Amen. Choose someone who values community and connection. They realize that you can't do this by yourself. God didn't make us to do this by yourself. In the scripture, David and Jonathan were close as friends and they exchanged armor and weapons. There's so much. I did a whole sermon before of what they did in that interaction. It's so unique. They had a covenant relationship. They even decided to defend each other as long as they lived. David even went far to help one of uh, Jonathan's sons after Jonathan died. How many guys can say Mephibosheth? It's a great story in the Bible. Look it up. He said, is there anyone left of the house of Jonathan that I can help? And they've discovered Mephibosheth. And it's interesting. Even after he died, he was so committed to him as a friend that he reached out to his children. 1 Samuel 18 says this, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. David had just killed the giant. And nobody really knew who he was. Matter of fact, it was interesting because Saul said, who is that guy? And they said, he's one of Jesse's sons. He said, go get him. I want to talk to him. I always thought that he knew him before, but he didn't know who he was. So after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, who was uh, the son of Saul, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. How many of you ever met someone and you just clicked? You had an immediate bond. Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact or a covenant with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Compare Saul and David with Jonathan and David. Jonathan was in line to be the king, yet he recognized the hand of God and the anointing on David. He knew that David was going to take the place that if he fought for it, he could get. He was in line to be the next king. Saul, on the other hand, was jealous. And as soon as David started succeeding in war, Saul became jealous of him. And he did crazy stuff. He chased him for years. One time he threw a sword at him. Amen. Just a crazy story. Think about the difference. Because you see the character of Saul and the character of Jonathan. I think Jonathan is one of the most unsung heroes of Scripture. Talk about somebody who had no ambition. He served his dad who was in error. He was loyal to his dad, even to his death. But he never betrayed his friend. Even to his dad. He never betrayed his friend. That is friendship. I love that. Jonathan let down his guard with David. He gave him his weapons. He gave everything that he had that could hurt David, he gave to David. He became vulnerable. And he identified with David. Uh, think about this. Jonathan was a prince in line for the kingship. And David was a shepherd and he probably smelled like sheep. And he identified with them anyway. He didn't say, well, I'm here and you're here. You identify with the friend regardless of how much money they've got or whatever. You connect with them as a person. Amen. I love that. They were true friends. Next, choose someone who has long-standing friendships. Look at somebody who actually has a habit of staying connected to people. Not somebody who's like, somebody says it's like a hummingbird. I love to watch hummingbirds. They won't come into my yard very much, but every, every once in a while they do. I just love the science of it though. They just hover. It's fascinating. But a lot of people are like that. They just flit from place to place to place. By the way, if you guys know how to track hummingbirds, let me know. Because <laughs> they come and go. But think about that. That's the way a lot of people do with their relationships. They're in, they're out, they're in, they're out. They're never committed. They hang loose. Amen? You can't connect with someone who never connects with anyone else. You all right? I want to be close to people who have demonstrated loyalty and longevity. They are like gold. Search carefully for your friends. God has them for you. Find them, value them, connect with them, and stay with them. Jesus did that. And he built the greatest kingdom in the history of of the world. So choose your friends prayerfully and say, God, what am I looking for? That doesn't mean that someone you don't choose as a close friend has anything wrong with them. It just means Jesus had the three and the other nine were not as close. They were just as good. They just weren't as close. So make sure you say, who's my one? Who's my three? Who's my 12? Who's my 70? You okay? Next thing, treat marriage as a friendship. 
after 40 years of marriage almost, 40 years of pastoring and doing marriage counseling, studying it intensely, looking at my parents and Becky's parents and all the different people in the church that have been such a blessing to me, I've come to the conclusion the best way to have a good marriage is to see your spouse as a friend. See what the Bible says about friendship. If you treat your spouse like the Bible says to treat a friend, you'll be close as you can be. Whatever it says about a friend, just put your spouse in there. Treat them that way. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Just treat that person like a friend. Becky and I noticed when we first got married that a lot of times people try to get in between you and your spouse. Like, you know, like they would say to Becky, uh, you know, you just need a girlfriend. You can just say anything to. Well, and she said, well, I kind of want to talk to my husband. And so there was always somebody trying to get in there. I might be stepping on some emotional toes here. But there's always been people like, you know, you need to come. You need to be my closest friend. No, Jesus. And then Becky's my closest friend. Don't let anybody else in there. Don't let anybody come between you and your spouse. Say, but I need a girlfriend. Well, then you probably shouldn't be married. Just a thought. Well, I just need a friend, a guy I can talk to. Your marriage will be better if you'll learn to talk to your spouse. You guys are quiet, but it's the truth. 40 years, I'm not taking it back. The first thing on the planet that God said was not good was solitude. A lot of people feel like I just need to be alone because there's less pressure. There is. But it's this part of life that makes you grow. If you only have this, life just feels easy. You read your Bible, you pray, and then you just go on. But then all of a sudden, there's Herman and Sally, and they're saying crazy things, and they're doing crazy things, and they're bringing out crazy things in you. And people say, but I don't want that because it's stressful. Yeah, absolutely is. But that's how you grow. Those relationships make you grow. They make you challenge things in your life that are not kosher. And you say, wait a minute, I can't act like that. <clears throat> you know, this week, as an example, confession again, uh, Becky and I, when we bought our house, we have wood floors and they were really dull. So we got an allowance for our floors. And so they said, we can come in. These guys can come in. We can just clean it and restain it. And it's going to be great. And the guy called me up and said, I can't do that because they didn't stain it. They just whacked it. So we got to, we got to take all of the uh, top layer off. We got to sand it, which means we haven't been living in our house for five days. We've been eating out every meal for, for five days. <laughs> We've had enough. And on the way to church this morning, I said, you know, I apologize. I am really tense and I've been incredibly rude. Amen. And Becky says, amen. <laughs> Nothing to do with her. It's just life happens. But you know what? As much as I don't like the fact that that happened, that was like putting up a mirror to my face saying, Terry, you don't have it all together yet. Sometimes life can make you mean. Amen. Should I hold up the mirror to you guys? Sometimes life can make you mean. And sometimes you got to say, okay, there's a reason why I'm doing that, but that's no excuse. When the world squeezes you, whatever's in you comes out. Amen. Boy, that's good. Treat marriage as a friendship. Think about some of these scriptures. I'm just going to read them. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We talked before a few weeks ago about the difference between an acquaintance and a friendship. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Those are all Proverbs. John 15 says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. Greater love is no one than this, but that someone would lay down his life for his friend. Laying down your life doesn't mean necessarily dying for someone. It means living for someone. It means sacrificing for someone. If you'll start doing things intentionally sacrificing, God will bless that. I think it was Rory one time we were saying, you know, we're talking about marriage and she said, you know, me and Rick just try to out love each other, out serve each other. If you just think of it from that perspective is not what is this marriage giving me? What is this friendship giving me? But what can I sow into this? What can I do for that person? Not only that, what can I do for that person that nobody knows I did? And God will reward it. What can I do in private? Because God rewards you in, uh, when you do things in secret. Amen? 
Ecclesiastes 4 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not got another one to lift him up. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. A real friend, when they have a relationship with you, will tell you the truth. You know, if you've got food on your face, sorry about that sound, guys. If you've got food on your face, a real friend will say, hey, you got something on your face. Somebody that doesn't care will say, well, that, they're going to laugh about that later and go on. Amen. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. They'll tell you the truth about you. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Love covers over without covering up. It's not just hiding stuff so people can get away with something, but it's covering over and not exposing. Just think about how Noah's son exposed him. It's not exposing someone. You know, one of the radioactive things among people is gossip. But here's the thing. If you don't listen, they can't gossip. If you listen, you're just as guilty. When you talk about someone behind their back, it's a sign of cowardice. Because you don't have the courage to go to them and say, here's what I think about you. I heard one time a, a pastor, a guy was trashing someone to him. He said, wait a minute. So he just took him. He said, let's go see that guy. So he took him over to the guy who was talking about. I said, now tell me what you just, tell him what you just told me. What if we lived that way? What if we didn't talk about people when they weren't present and we really didn't gossip? It'd just be amazing how much that would change us. Amen. Everybody say, boy, that's good. You guys okay today? Whoever covers an offense seeks love. Think about it. Love covers a multitude of transgressions. Love covers a multitude of transgressions. I need some covering. How about you? A dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. Isn't that good? Ruth one says this, and this is about a lady and her mother-in-law. And she's actually not officially her mother-in-law anymore because her, her husband has died. But here's what she said. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. Also, if anything but death parts me from you. That is a picture of friendship. I'm committed to you for the rest of your life, no matter what. Amen. I know there's a great story about John Maxwell. He would uh, be at the office and something exciting would happen and they would all celebrate. Then he would go home from work and his wife said, what happened today? And he said, oh, nothing. And he realized he was sharing all of his victories with people that wasn't his best friend. So he started putting a three by five card in his pocket and he started writing down the most exciting things and he shared them with her before he shared them with anybody else. Best friends. You okay? Yeah. Look at the marriages you want to follow. In every case, they're friends. I can tell you so many people that were a part and are a part of this church. I look at their marriage and their marriage can be measured by the friendship of the couple. You okay? Everybody say, go on. <laughs> Lastly, give me five minutes on this one. Get involved in a small group so you can be discipled and grow. When Jesus wanted to change the world, he started a small group. He preached to the multitude, then he discussed it with the 12. Hebrews 10 says this, verse 24. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us think about ways to encourage other people to do that. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage each other, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What is that saying? The closer we get to the return of Jesus Christ, which I think could, he, could be in our lifetime, I could be wrong, but I could be right. The closer we get to the return of Jesus, the more we need people. The more I need to be around people who are not talking trash on, on talk shows and stuff. I need to be around people who are reading their Bible and praying. I need, you know, somebody was trying to convince me of a conspiracy theory, not following the Lord this week, and they were just going into stuff, and I was thinking, wow, I don't care. <laughs> it just doesn't help me. Even if that were true, that just doesn't help me. You know, in the middle of all of this, God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. No matter what's going on, 
God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Amen. Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples, it said. He did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So he would preach and then he would share with his disciples. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? So notice the relationship Jesus had with the multitude, but then he had a relationship with the 12. He also had a relationship with the three. He would take them on special, special assignments, but he poured his life into the 12. Jesus poured his life into 12 people and said, this is my only plan. In John 17, he says, Father, I'm praying for these guys and for everyone who will believe through these 12. And then he got 11 real quick. Amen. Think about it. I said 11, that's nine, but I did go right city. So I'm, yeah, <laughs> only got 10 fingers. So there you go. Think about it though. You and I are sitting here today because Jesus poured his life into 11 guys who gave it to people, who gave it to people, who gave it to people. That's the way the kingdom expands. Not, somebody asked me this morning, how many people can fit in this room? A lot, but you know what? The answer in life, the answer in discipling people is not getting a bigger crowd together. There's a place for a crowd, there's a place for corporate worship, but the way to change the world is face-to-face, one-on-one, pouring your life into people. You okay? There's a bunch of stuff in my notes about small groups. I encourage you to get my notes for free. Terry at fcfc.tv. But here's what I want to say about small groups. The subject of a small group is you. It's not even, it's not another church service. We don't want small group leaders who teach. The purpose of a small group is for you to apply it and for you to be put in you know, on the table, so to speak, and say, how is this working or not working in your life? How can we help you to actually do this? Not just to hear a sermon, but how do I do this? Amen. And so that's the idea of a small group is it's a place where you can grow by being challenged by people who love you. And it's a place where everybody knows your name. Amen. Let me close with Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 11. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Jesus is our standard. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new doctrine or doctrine or teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. That's relationship. That's love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Now listen to this. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. First of all, you have a, you have a work to do in the body of Christ that we need. Thank God for reaching out to the world. But I'm talking today about having friends within church. I'm talking about your relationship with other Christians. You know, the Bible says when we receive communion, we should discern the Lord's body. That's just Jesus on the cross part of it, but it's also the body of Christ that's sitting around you. Discerning the body of Christ is relationships. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. Why don't you turn to somebody and say, we really need you. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Healthy and growing and full of love. How do you do that? By interacting with other people. It's not just sermons. It has to go beyond that. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I thank you for every person here today, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for everyone that's coming to the second service and everyone that's watching online. God, help us in this area. It's a challenge. Relationships are a challenge. Lord, help us to deal with ourselves properly and help us to deal with others properly. Help us to truly speak the truth in love. Father, I ask that in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just in case you're here this morning and you've never made the decision to cross the line to receive Jesus, those guys who got baptized this morning received Jesus. What does that mean? It means they believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross He was, he died, he was buried, he rose again after paying for your sin and my sin 
And then he offered to you and I total forgiveness and cleansing from all sin. He said, that's a great idea. What do I have to do? All you have to do is believe it. But then you have to say, Jesus, from this point on, I belong to you. I trust you with my life to forgive me, to give me new life. I need that forgiveness, but I need the life that you give me. So if you want to pray that and you believe it, say this after me. Father, Father in, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I believe, I believe Jesus Christ Jesus. went to the cross for me. Cross for Lord, I give myself to you because you gave yourself for me. I trust you to forgive me and to cleanse me. In Jesus' name, amen.